Father, we, uh, we look forward to our time together this morning and as we come again and study your word and just, just feast upon it. We thank you for, for even thinking of us to, to write this book for us, that uh, you know that we treasure it, we love it, and that we turn to it for, for uh, correction, reproof, and for righteousness. Father, bless our time as we look upon your ascent to your throne on this earth. Amen. 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 All right, so we are in chapter 20. Boy, we're moving along here. Three more chapters, 20, 21, and 22, chapter 20 now. Um, the, the tribulation has ended. Christ has come and defeated his enemies. He has taken the, the two uh, bad actors, the two characters, in the person of the Antichrist and his false prophet. And what did he do with those two guys? He cast them into the lake of fire. That's where, that's where he sent them. The lake of fire is the permanent hell. That's permanent hell. We'll see a, a temporary hell today as we look through um, this book. This is the thousand year reign, the true theocracy. This is, there was a false theocracy. Who was that, that that was on this earth? What's the false theocracy that was attempted? False theocracy. The what? The, false the, antichrist. The, the antichrist. The antichrist attempted to set himself up as God. Remember, he declared himself to be God in the temple. An image was set up to him. They were to worship him, and and they were to be marked by him. And so that was his attempt, Satan's attempt at a theocracy on earth. That was the false one. But now we have the true theocracy. And so as we we move forward, that before we do anything else, there's some unfinished business, some mopping up that has to be done, and that has to do with dealing with Satan. So we, we have uh, the false prophet that's been dealt with, the antichrist that's been dealt with, but now Satan is going to be dealt with. And so in chapter 20, we're going to look at verses 1 through 3. That's how we're going to start off. So let's go there. Chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. Verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss. Now, we've seen this, uh, something happen before with this. We've seen somebody come down from the heavens, holding the key to the abyss. Who was that? Michael? No. Jesus. Satan. 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 In, in the fifth trumpet judgment, the first quote judgment, if you remember... Satan was, uh, we saw an, a, a falling star, a star that, that had fallen from the heavens, and it had the key to the abyss. Let's go look at that for a second. Go back to Revelation 9 and go to verse, uh, verse 1. And uh, verses 1 through 3, let's read those, and, and it'll kind of give you a jog your memory here. Actually, let's, let's read verses 1 and 2. Verses 1 and 2. Who has that that can read that for me? Then the fifth angel was founded, and I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth, and the key of the bottomless pit was given to him. He opened the pit, he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke went up out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. Oh, okay, good. So so we here we have the this this look at this this pit. That's what it is. It reminds you of, of uh, what they had back in, in John's day with some of their dungeons. There were actually pits in the ground, and they had hatches on them, and they would open the hatches up, and they would throw a, the prisoner in that pit, into the darkness of the pit. And this is called the, the bottomless pit. It was so, it's so dark you can't see the bottom of it. This is the abyss. This is a temporary hell that's been set up. It's a, it was sort of like a... Um, a, a temporary prison until a person is brought before the judge for judgment. And so th in this pit, according to Jude, this is what it, it says, angels who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode, he, God, has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. All right, so these are angels. Uh, these are bad angels, angels who, who operated outside of what God authorized, and God said, no, I'm going to net now house you in this temporary pit, in this dark, bottomless thing that's a temporary hell, and only demons are in there. 
And so, and they've been in there for thousands of years. So, so the agitation of these horrific creatures, thousands and thousands of years, well, when that, when that pit is opened up, that's when it says, the, man, the smoke and the, you can imagine the steam that's coming out of this place. That's what this place is. And only demons are there. Steve. Yes. So which ones are the ones that are roaming the earth now if they're in, in hell? Which ones are roaming the earth? Yeah. Well, okay, well, there are, the question is which angels, the demons, are roaming the earth? Well, these are a specific group of demons who violated God's uh, ordinance to uh, only operate within certain domains. We don't know what those domains are, except we know one that they violated. And remember the angels that tried to, uh, to create a master race by having intercourse with women? Uh, the Nephilim, those are the ones that he has sent into this, into this domain. The other ones are still allowed to roam, as Satan is. Remember Satan, when he was called uh, in Book of Job, he's called up, God says, what have you been doing? Where have you been going? And Satan says, well, I've been roaming to and fro about the earth. He has total access to, to roaming to and fro of the earth. Uh, but the special class of demons, or this group of demons, I call them special only because they violated the, do the domain of God and then... Uh, he then said, you're going to be bound until I'm ready to release you. And we also talked, if you remember, um, the, the, the demons that were in Legion. Remember that guy that, that had the demons inside? What is your name? My name is Legion, which means many, 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 maybe, maybe hundreds or thousands. When, when Christ cast that, those demons out, they begged him not to send them into the abyss. They said, Please don't send us there. Let us go into those pigs. And that's, he said, okay, you can do that. And that's where they went. So they have great terror about this place, this abyss. And that's where we first see this. Uh, 2 Peter 2.4 says this, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to the pits of darkness reserved for judgment. So this is a, a, a pit, a temporary holding cell, just for demons, this abyss, until that day of judgment. And, and that's, that's what we see. All right, so... Um, we are looking, we're back on chapter 20 in our Bibles. Then I saw an angel, verse 1 again. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. So he has both the key to the abyss, and this angel, by the way, is not a demon. This is, this is a good angel. This is an angel of God being sent down with authorization by having the key to the abyss to, to bind Satan. And the fact that he has a chain along with that, he's not only has to, he's not only going to put him behind bars, but he's also going to chain him. You know, it has to be a really bad character to do that. Mm -hmm. I, I always think back of um, uh, the, the movie Silence of the Lambs. Yeah. Anybody see that? Yeah. When in Hannibal Lecter, what a monster he was! And they had him, they had him in a straight jacket and a mask on him behind bars. You know, because they were terrified of the guy. And that's the kind of picture I think we see here of Satan. In fact. In fact, there's some descriptions of him. We will we'll see why he's bound. Um, verse 2, here we go. Here's your descriptions. And he laid hold of the dragon. What's a dragon? Well, it's a mythical creature. It's a monster that breathes fire. That's a, one picture of him. So the dragon, the serpent of old. That's that slithery creature that, that uh, bamboozled Eve, that beguiled Eve who is the devil, devil means adversary, and Satan, Satan means deceiver of the nations. So when you read that again, it says, and he laid hold of the monster who is associated with evil, the beguiling serpent, who is the adversary of God and man, and who is the deceiver of nations. That's a pretty terrifying creature, and that is who Satan is. And so, th and so this angel that's coming down, he's unnamed, but he has great authority, and the authority is to bind, to bind Satan, and also to throw him into this pit, and it says for a thousand years. That is for the whole millennium. Deep. That's not the same angel in, in chapter nine. No, in chapter nine, the angel that fell from the heavens, the star, that was Satan himself. And Satan was given the keys to the abyss in order to open that up so that the fifth woe judgment could be cast upon men. And that was the locusts that were coming out, these demonic locusts, remember that? Okay, so Satan was given authority to open the pit, but now we have an angel coming from heaven, and that angel is given the authority to not only open the pit, but also to bind and cast Satan into it. It's a good angel. He's a good guy. 
there's a third thing. He sealed it. Yes. As well. Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm going to get to that in just a second here. We're going to, in verse 3. Um, and he threw him, and he threw him into the abyss. That throwing him, again, it, it's, a, it's a pit in the floor, right? And, and when they take a prisoner, they would just throw him in there. It's, it was casting them down. It was a, it's a demeaning thing, is what they're doing. So they're throwing down the, the leader of all of the demons that's in that pit already, and they're throwing him down as a, as a way of showing him to be demeaned and, and to showing that his power is lost. He's going to be bound inside of that pit for a thousand years along with these other demons that are kept there. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it, bang, slammed that door down and sealed it. That's a sealing of the pit. That's, that's if you can think of something that's hermetically sealed, something that just won't even leak water. That's the sealing that takes place. And it was sealed over him. So he's, again, he's in this pit and he's looking up and the hatch door is sealed and it's sealed over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. So this term thousand years keeps coming up. When it keeps coming up like that, it, we number one associate it with the millennium, but when scripture uses a term over and over and over again, we can take that literally, all right? So it keeps saying it's gonna be a thousand, a thousand means a thousand, it doesn't mean just some period of time. There are some teachers that will tell you in some positions where they say that the millennium is not necessarily a thousand years, it, uh, it could be a day or it could be a hundred years or it could be longer. But a thousand is what it means. It is a millennial period. After these things, it says in verse 3, he must be released a short time. Jeff. Do you have any... I've often read that in my head. Why should he be released? Well. The only thing that we know of is, is that God is in control, all right? This is all part of God's plan. God's plan is to release him. I, I think it has a lot to do with, with um, as we'll get into the second part of this, right after the millennium when he's released and there's a rebellion, I think it's, it's, it will show us then, again, man's nature and man's heart, yeah. And so he's going he's gonna to do something again that's, I find pretty interesting. But hang on to that question. I think we'll see that. So this angel that comes down, um, we don't know his name, uh, but in the Bible, the, the, the archangel Michael always seems to be the one that is contending with Satan. Remember when Moses died and his body was contended for? That was between Satan and Michael. They fought over that body. So even though we don't know who it is, a lot of people say it's Michael. We don't really know. But whoever it is, he is given the key to the abyss and has the authority to bind Satan for that period of time. So let's go to our, our worksheet there. We don't know who the angel is, but he has the authority, the keys and the chain to bind Satan for the entire millennial reign of Christ. There will be no interference, deception, or turmoil caused by Satan during this 1,000-year period. We are, however, informed that after this long period, God will allow Satan to be released, but only for a short time. We continue to rest in the knowledge that God is in control. God is controlling this whole thing. He hadn't taken his hand off of it one bit. And he uses Satan however he wants. Kathy. Yeah. Satan's put into the pit. Yes. What about the demons? Uh, I, I take it that, that all of the demons will be put there too. I think when Satan is there, God is removing demon, de demonic activity from the earth. Man is going to be left under his own devices. So I take that Satan and all the rest of the demons will be housed there too. I take that that's going to be a temporary, temporary restraining order for a thousand years where they're going to be restrained. And man on his own, man with his own nature, will be uh, the one that's going to be rebelling during that period of time. Yeah, so. 
Mm -hmm. Without the help of Satan. Without the help of Satan. Clay. I think you answered some of this, but Linda, Columbo's question about the changes on the earth and in the abyss. What determines, or where is in Scripture that says there's some in the, in the abyss right now? I thought they were all, when they all say, don't send us into the abyss before the time, I didn't realize there's some guys that are already there. Yeah. 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 Well, well, we know that there's some there by, I think it was Jude 6, that, that uh, let me get my notes here. Yeah, uh, Jude 6, the angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. That's Jude 6. Um, and under 2 Peter 2, 4, 4, if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, and committed them to the pits of darkness, that form of hell is the abyss, reserved for judgment. And so there, there are only, there's only certain angels that are there, fallen angels, demons that are there, and we know that there are others by, by of course, the, uh, we see the demonic activity throughout the Gospels. Yeah, right. What's the difference between the lake of fire and the abyss? Okay, good, good question. What's the difference between the lake of fire and the abyss? The abyss is a temporary holding cell only for demons. The lake of fire is the final hell. Everything, everything's going to get thrown in there. It's going to be a mixture of people and demons in there, and it ain't going to be pretty. You know, you, you see the, some of these cartoons where they have the smiling Satan, and he's got the pitchfork, and, the, and, and all the demons are having a great time, and they're tormenting people. No, no, no. It is going to be demonic hell for everyone and every, every being that's in there. And the false prophet and the Antichrist are in the lake of fire, not the abyss. Exactly. Uh, at, this, at this time, at the time of this writing, that, that only the false prophet and the Antichrist are in the lake of fire. They were thrown in there alive into the lake of fire. Everything else happens at this point in the abyss. Now, how they were thrown alive, these are humans, how they were thrown alive into the lake of fire, I don't know. And, and how they... they they, they're still alive. At the end of a thousand years, they'll finally be joined by Satan and then all the other people from the great white throne of judgment. That's when they'll be joined. But how they're still alive, maybe God um, resurrects them, kills them, resurrects them instantaneously, and then throws them alive into the pit. Maybe that's what happens. He doesn't tell us. But it says they were thrown alive into that pit. But that's the difference. Lake of fire is permanent. Once, once the great white throne judgment takes place, death Hades, the pit, everything is thrown into that, into the lake of fire. It all, it all dies. It's all death. That's what it'll all be called. Okay? Any, any other questions on that? Good questions. Nick? You know, it's interesting that at the rapture, uh, Christ is going to give us believers bodies suitable to live in heaven. And it's going to be instantaneously. Yes. It could very well be that they, they got instantaneously gave these two bodies to live in, in, in hell. For eternity, yes. Yeah. They yeah. yeah. have the bodies of life, they have bodies of death. And we see, we have seen, we, or will see what we God can do for believers. So it's not far fetched just to believe that God will do exactly the opposite. Right. give them bodies of death that they can take care of. Yeah, good. Thanks. You, yeah, you know that we know that there's going to be a resurrection of the of the unsaved, and that resurrection that'll be a resurrection of bringing together their soul, spirit with their bodies too, and that's how they'll stand before the great white throne of judgment. Jeff. Yes, yeah, so kind of on this. Subject. Where is the shield? Shield. Okay, uh, shield. Um, I'm trying to think of my. Hades, let's talk about Hades there. I think that's a, that's a, Sheol I think is a general term for death. Where, where, the, where, where, where the body goes, where the body goes into death, into Sheol. Hades is another form. Hades is a, is a temporary holding cell. And Hades had in it the soul and spirit of a person when they died. The believers went on one side, the unbelievers on the other side. There was a great gulf between them, right? We know that from Lazarus and the rich man, yeah. right? When, when Christ went to the cross uh, and was resurrected, he went into Hades and he took those prisoners out of there. That, when I say prisoners, those, the, those ones who were saved 
uh, and were in the, the um, what is it called, the Abraham's bosom. It was a pleasant place, right? It wasn't a bad place. And took those to heaven. But what remains there to till this day is where the, the soul and spirit of the unsaved go. So when a person who dies and they're not saved, their soul and spirit goes to Hades, their body goes in the ground, the believer when he dies, soul and spirit go immediately to be with the Lord, absent from the body, present with the Lord, but the body goes into the grave. And then, of course, when the resurrection takes place, they'll be, soul and spirit will be rejoined with the body. Nick? Unless I'm mistaken, I think uh, <clears throat> Sheol and Hades is the same place. Same place. And uh, Sheol is the Hebrew Old Testament term. Hades is the New Testament. Uh, the Greek term, huh? Yeah. Okay. But, uh, it speaks, I think it's the <clears throat> okay. So, Good. Did you hear that? Yes. Everybody heard that? Good. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. All right. <laughs> Any other questions before we move forward? Because we're about to get into Steve, the y yes. I know. Okay. But there are some people that believe death is extension. 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 extension? Yeah, extension. Okay. <laughs> All right. And, uh, you know, they think it's just over with. Yes. The great sleep, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. You know, that, that song that, that John Lennon, Imagine, Imagine This, Imagine That, what's well, how people imagine things and they make things up as to how they hope it's going to be. But that's not what the Bible says. Some people think that when they die, well, you just it just ends. That's all. You become one with the universe. That guy, Carl Sagan, you know, the cosmos. He would talk about and how big I'd become one with the cosmos. Well, he's not one with the cosmos. Right now, he's in Hades because he denied the the Creator, and and he called God this or his God is is the cosmos. Jeff, what did Jesus tell the repentant thief on the cross? Yeah, this this day. Yeah, you'll be with me in paradise. Yeah, where he is, that's that's where the that's where that man was. When, yep. Yeah. Maybe that's what the Catholics think might be purgatory. It's Hades, like a holding place to you. Uh, right. No, purgatory was something one of the popes made up. Yeah, they they, they made that up as a, as a as a um, halfway house. It's a halfway house. It's a Catholic thing. Yeah, it, it's very Roman Catholic. It's a halfway house where, where, where your sins, you have to be purged. You have to be purged from the sins that were not bad enough to send you to hell. Steve, was right. also a reason for the indulgence. Yeah, and also a reason for the indulgence. If you wanted to pray somebody out for a small fee. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a whole Catholic thing. That, that, but yes. Yeah, that's purgatory does not exist. Nowhere in Scripture will you find that. Ever. Okay. Huh? Or limbo. Or limbo. Yeah. Limbo's a game. That's it. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? All right. Let's, let's, yes. Susan. What do you say about Abraham's bosom, which was part of Hades? Yes. Yes. Those people are now in heaven. So Lazarus, you know, Lazarus and all of the, all of the Old Testament saints, that's where they went, to Abraham's bosom when they died. And, and, uh, when when Christ uh, went to the cross, that was that was the release of any anyone that was kept out of heaven. And so at that point, all those ones that were in the Abraham's bosom side of Hades, they were released to heaven. Yes, okay, Phil. Phil. So there's no paradise today. Well, par I think paradise and and uh, where where Jesus said, "This day you will be with me in paradise." I think he's referring to heaven. That, that I think is paradise. Yeah, because that after he went to the cross that day, um, that was it. The, 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 everything was opened up. And then all those guys got to go back for the resurrection of the Old Testament saints. All those got yeah. All the Old Testament saints that that went to Hades, they will be resurrected at the end of the tribulation, according to Daniel twelve one and two, which we looked at last two weeks ago, I think. Right. Yeah, their bodies will be resurrected. In fact, we'll look at that today if we have time. I don't know if we'll get to that or not, but we, we'll, we'll look at that today. Good, good questions. Anybody else? All right, let's let's uh, move forward here. Then we're going to go to the millennium. Now, the millennium. Get this: no armies. There won't be any armies. No hospitals. No bureaucracies. No bureaucracies. You go to get a driver's license, you know, and you got 
85 people in the waiting room and one person, two, two people behind the counter, and one of them's always sharpening the pencil. <laughs> You're not going to have that anymore. How do I know that? Well, because we are going to be, the saints will be there at part of the administration of Christ. You know, I'm not saying we're going to be government workers, Dave, don't worry about that. But, I mean, imagine getting a phone call from the President of the United States says, you know, hey, um, Billy, I want you to come up here to Washington and be the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of the Treasury or something. Yes, sir, I'll be on my way. What an honor that will be. And that's the, that's the positions of ruling and reigning with Christ that the believer will have. So there's not going to be bureaucracies. There's not going to be mortuaries. We're going to see that in this thousand year period of time, death is going to be an absolute exception rather than the rule. No threat of wars, famines, or diseases. It's going to be an amazing thing. And how about this? A Bible study on the book of Daniel. Something like that. What's so great about that? We can have one now. Yeah, but the guest speaker is Daniel the prophet. He's going to be with us. Down the hall you can go see Paul, and he's going to be giving a class on Romans. And further down, John, he'll be doing a class on Revelation. How do you like to, to, to attend that? That would be wonderful. So, so, man, the millennium is like, yeah, bring it on. All right, so we have the, the millennium. We're going to look and see not a whole lot of information is given in the book of Revelation. But the Old Testament guys give us some information. So go to Isaiah chapter 11. The book of Isaiah chapter 11. You guys there? Everybody there? All right. Verse 1. Then a shoot. He's talking about now that this is the millennial reign. Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse. Well, who's Jesse? Well, he was the father of David, and, and or maybe it was a grandfather. I can't remember which one. And, the, and, the, and the, the stem of him is before him. And a branch from his roots will bear fruit. And that's one after him. Well, who's before Jesse and after Jesse? Christ. He was there before. Jesus was there before eternity and he will be there after after Jesse he's a descendant the spirit of the Lord will rest on him he's talking about Christ here on the Messiah the spirit of understanding and wisdom the spirit of counsel and strength the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord that's the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit so all of the attributes of the Holy Spirit will be upon this Messiah all of that and that's who will be doing the ruling and reigning he will delight in the fear of the Lord. I'm in verse 3 there. I'm going to turn my eyes here. And he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear. I mean, that's how we judge. We're limited to our senses, right? That's what, But not him. He's omniscient. We're going to have someone on the throne that knows everything about everything about everybody. He'll be able to cut right through anything. So his judgment will be perfect. But with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. A perfect judicial and administration, administrative system with no partiality. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Now that's an important part right there. What does he mean by that? Well, he's going to be a tough ruler. He's going to have to be. But here we have an indication that there will be capital punishment. So there will be death, but death is going to be the exception. And he will issue uh, forth executions of the wicked. Verse 5, also righteousness will be about the belt of his loins and faithfulness the belt about his waist. In other words, a perfect king. Verse 6, and the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion will, and the fatling together. And the little boy will lead them. Also the cow and the bear will graze. They're going to graze. They're going to, they're going, there's no more carnivorous animals anymore. Their young will, be, will lie down together and the lion will eat straw like the ox. Verse 8. The nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra and the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. There won't be any danger, no danger of an animal striking a child or being um, 
eaten by an animal. Verse 9, they will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Then in that day, what day is that? The day of the Lord. So the day of the Lord includes the millennium? Yes, it does. So we see that here. Remember how we said the macro day of the Lord? It starts with the first seal judgment and goes all the way through the millennium. That's called, that's the big picture of the day of the Lord. In that day, the nations, the Gentile nations, will resort to the root of Jesse. That is, that they're going to submit to him, who will stand as a signal or a standard for the peoples. And his resting place, that's Jerusalem, will be glorious. A, a picture of what that millennial kingdom will be like. Now, let's turn, while you're in Isaiah, he gives us a little bit more information in chapter 65. So go there. Isaiah 65. And we're going to go to verse 18. And here's what it says. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing and her people for gladness. I will also rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. And there will no longer be heard in her the voice of weeping and the sound of crying. Verse 20, no longer will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, no more infant mortality, or an old man who does not live out his days. For the youth will die at an age of 100. In other words, a person 100 years old that dies will be called, man, he died really young. You know? And the one who does not reach the age of 100 shall be thought accursed. Uh, and a cursed person is one who's a criminal who's executed. That's what, that's what that means there. So in other words, the, the only death that appears to be that will take place will be when a person is executed and they will be called accursed at that time. So we have quite a picture of, of this millennial kingdom. And um, boy, I'm, I'm getting almost out of time. Let me just give you a couple more pieces of information and we'll call this a day and I'll pick up next week. So, some more characteristics of the millennium. It's going to be the center of power on earth uh, will be Jerusalem. Jerusalem's going to have to be rebuilt. Uh, we see that there's an enormous earthquake that takes place at the end of the seventh bowl judgment. Jerusalem, it, it appears that the city is split. So Jer Jerusalem's going to be rebuilt, and it will be the center of power on the earth. It'll be like uh, the Washington, D.C. Christ will rule as heir as the heir of David. Some commentators believe that the resurrected David, the Old Testament saint, he's going to be with us too, will rule in conjunction with Christ. I don't think that that's the case. I don't see David taking the throne in parallel with Christ. That's his king. Uh, in uh, verse 4 of chapter 20, we already talked about this, the Old and New Testament saints, along with the resurrected tribulation saints, will reign with Christ, will all have glorified bodies and be free from sin. And here's an important part. The earth will be vastly different from what we see around us today. We talk about the, the seventh seal judgment in chapter 16. It results in the topography being changed. Let's turn real quick to Revelation 16. Revelation 16, verses 17 through 20. Revelation 16, Jimmy, when you get there, I want to read verses 17 through 20 and listen for the for the amount of destruction that takes place. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, "It is done." Then there came flashes of lightning, rumbles of <clears throat> rumbles, pearls of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since man has been on earth. So tremendous <coughs> earthquake. The, the earth, so, so tremendous was the quake, the great city split in three parts, parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with wine of the fury of his wrath. Every island fled away, and the mountains could not be found. From, from the sky, huge hailstones of about a hundred pounds each fell upon men. 
and they cursed God on account of the plague of hail, because the plague was so terrible. Good. Okay, so you see an earthquake, something like has never been seen before, and the earthquake is so violent, it says that mountains can't be found. In other words, the topography is going to change. Islands that exist, they're not going to be there anymore. It almost sounds like the, the, the continental shifts and the, the divides in the continents, they may come back together again. Uh, Dr. Henry Morris, in his book, um, and I'm going to read a little bit to you here, and this will be the last thing we'll look at. He thinks that, that the whole earth will go back to a pre-flood condition before the, before the great flood. And here's what he says. Um, the seven seal judgment in chapter 16 will result in the topography being changed. In the Revelation record, Dr. Henry Morris makes this statement and theorizes that physically the earth will resemble the earth before Noah's flood. Number one, that the, that the world had the water vapor canopy that resulted in a worldwide temperate climate with no polar caps and no violent storms. In other words, October weather year-round. <laughs> can, can, you, can you deal with that in Louisiana? I can. Bobby. Hey, but man, 65, you started in 18, 17, I will, I will create a new heaven and a new earth. Former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. So let me create a new heaven and new earth. Time out. The new heaven and new earth, he will do that, but that happens after the millennium. This is, this is before the millennium, at the beginning of, at the end of the tribulation we have this amazing disaster that, that's taken place to the point where you can't see the mountains and you can't see islands anymore. Everything has been, been shifted around, right? And that's the situation that will be uh, presented to us as we return to the earth, all right? So we're going to have this, this, it appears, a temperate climate year round. Uh, men and, and animals were not carnivorous. And there was no fear of man among the animal world. The fear of man among the animals and the permission to eat flesh was part of the covenant that God established with Noah and the human race after the flood. So before the flood, there was no meat eaters around, whether man or beast. But here's what, he, what Genesis 9, 2, and 3 says, uh, where God uh, talks to Noah and he gives him, th this is post-flood, he says this, The fear of you and the terror of you will be on every beast of the earth, and on every bird of the sky, with everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea, into your hand they are given. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. If it moves, you can eat it. I give all to you as I gave the green plant. All right. So we have we have that picture of of what the earth will probably look like after this uh, tremendous earthquake, and then uh, there's going to have to be reconstruction during that period of time. Now next week we'll take a look at a, um, I call it the missing in action 75 days. We'll look at that and we'll talk about that next week. Probably during that 75 day period there'll be a tremendous amount of work being done uh, in order to reconstruct the earth, Jerusalem, and all those, uh, those cities. Okay, so we're going to stop here. I'm out of time. And we'll pick it up next week. We're going to come back to chapter 20. Any questions or comments before we, we go? Uh, after Adam sinned, yes. an animal was killed. Yes. They had taken the skin and covered it. Yes. Did it change with the animals at that time? Maybe it became carnivorous and we ate animals. But no, they the, didn't. Yeah, no, there was no there was no eating of, of the flesh at that point. The animals that were sacrificed, uh, those were burnt offerings given to God. God used the skin of that animal to cover Adam and Eve. That was a that was a sacrifice in essence on Adam and Eve's uh, for Adam and Eve that God the did. Yep. That's the first death recorded until in Scripture. Right until after the flood. Where is that about the temperate weather all, all year round? I just made it up. You want that location? No, that it, it, it's it, look. It's not in scripture, but this is an opinion of, of Dr. Henry Morris. All right, that that's his opinion. I like it, don't you? I mean, it's what 92 degrees outside with about 90 percent humidity. So I'll take that October weather. Okay, are we good? We're done. Eric, can you close the doors? Father, we thank you again for this day, for the morning that you've given us together. Father, we thank you for your word and for what you've taught us from it this morning. Father, help us to take what we've learned this morning and apply it to our lives. Help us to be doers of the word and not just hearers. We thank you for Steve and for the preparation and all the, the old time he's put in. 
Father, help us to uh, be faithful to you this week. And bring us all back next week to do this again. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.